For those of you I have not met, my name is Lena Dobrier. I'm the Director of Operations at Opus Connect. We are a lower middle and middle market M&A focused organization, catering to uh, transactional professionals. We're a membership based organization. Our members primarily consist of private equity firms, investment bankers, lenders, independent sponsors, et cetera. Uh, we do a ton of different events per year. I think we're doing now close to 300 events a year now that everything is virtual. So it's quite busy. We have a lot of opportunities for you to get involved, uh, different formats. So if you're interested in learning a bit more about who we are, how we can help, uh, please feel free to reach out to my colleague, Swayze Yancey. His contact information is below. Um, during today's discussion, we will be taking Q&A. So please, as questions come to mind, feel free to submit them in the Q&A bubble that you see at the bottom of your screen. Please avoid using the chat function. We will only be monitoring uh, the Q&A. So go ahead and submit those as they come to mind. Our moderator will monitor those and we'll try to get to as many as possible. I wanna give an opportunity for our sponsors to say a few words. So David Kogan, I see you in here of Sapient Investigations. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Uh, please introduce yourself and your firm. Good morning, Lena. Hi, David Kogan with Sapient Investigations. We're a longtime sponsor of, of Opus. It's always good to be here. We um, specialize in basically corporate investigations of all sorts um, for the private equity crowd. It's primarily executive background checks. We would do a lot of deal work, looking at management teams, joint venture partners, uh, and large commercial borrowers. We also have a, a robust uh, litigation practice and business dispute practice. So we do a lot of enterprising work on that front as well when things go bad in deals and uh, looking at uh, fraud. Anyway, again, it's great to be here and I uh, look forward to, to meeting you guys all later in the day. Thank you, David. Uh, I don't believe Fran is in the room today, but I do want to give them a quick shout out. Alliant Insurance Services, they've been a sponsor of ours for over a year now. Big supporter and friend of Opus Connect. If Fran does join us, we'll maybe try to get her in at the end. But definitely want to acknowledge them and thank them for their support. Last and, but, and not least, um, Carolyn Kalari of Kalari Partners. She's going to be our moderator today, so we will wait uh, until we get to her introductions. But before we do, we have two poll questions that we'd like to ask of everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and launch the first one. Please don't be shy. We wanna know who you are. Independent sponsor, investment banker, capital provider on the debt side, capital provider on the equity side, service provider or other. Let us know, it'll give our panelists also a good idea of the breakdown in the room. Okay, so those of you who shared, 7% uh, independent sponsor, 7% investment banker, 21% uh, capital provider on the debt side, 16% capital provider on the equity side, 19% service provider, and 30% other. Hmm, uh, maybe we'll need to expand these a bit so we can understand better who are the others but we'll go ahead and launch the second question. And this is around in-person events. We are seeing a growing appetite from our network to get back into uh, in-person events. And we wanna know what your level of comfort is around that. So now, maybe after September, 2022, or nah, you're uh, comfortable from the comfort of your home, let us know, give it at 20 seconds and we'll move on. Okay, so 56% now, 33% post-September of this year, 
9% 2022, and 2% you're just where you are, you prefer it virtual. This is uh, interesting information for us to gather, so thank you for participating in that. Without further ado, I would like to introduce today's moderator, Carolyn Kalari of Kalari Partners. Carolyn, the floor is yours. Good morning, thank you, Lena. Good morning, everyone. Carolyn Kalari with Kalari Partners. Kalari Partners is a boutique law firm that was founded by former big law attorneys. We provide um, big law services to the lower and middle market, and we help investors, owners, executives to navigate various legal issues, serving as outside general counsel, M&A services, both healthy and distressed, corporate restructuring services for all types of constituencies that are involved with the bankruptcy. And uh, we, what we really like to do is we build our legal business uh, with relationships with people like you and the people on the panel and just try to help connect, um, you know, capital providers and where are the deals. And that's why we like to provide value by doing these types of panels and opportunities to collaborate with Opus Connect. So thank you to Opus for putting this together. Um, with that, I think what we should just do is go around and have each of the panelists introduce themselves. So we'll start with uh, you, Dan. Thank you, Carolyn. Appreciate uh, you inviting me to, to be on this panel. My name is Dan Arnold. I'm with uh, Hilco Global. Hilco is kind of a unique company uh, focused on assets and really any kind of asset you can imagine. Um, we're essentially a merchant bank for assets. So we value assets. We sell assets as an agent or a broker, or we buy assets for our own account with our own capital. And when buying them, we either buy them to liquidate those assets, to operate companies in different ways, or to redevelop or repurpose assets, particularly on the, the real estate side. So a pretty broad array of businesses based in Chicago with about 650 people across the world. I sit at our holding company and uh, work across all of the groups at Hilco. Thank you, Dan. Um, Lori? Oh, Lori, you're muted. Ah, sorry for that. Um, I'll start again. Good morning, and thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Carolyn and Opus Connect for uh, inviting me to speak on this panel. Um, I'm Lori Beers. I'm an investment banker at Cowan, and I head up the special situations and restructuring group uh, at Cowan. Um, we typically are mandated both on behalf of companies and investors in restructuring dis and distressed m &A situations. Um, some of our uh, recent engagements on behalf of companies include Carlos Pasta, uh, Vices, which was a specialty football helmet uh, manufacturer, um, and um, sorry, there was another one I was going to mention, but I can't remember it. On behalf of investors, we represented the official uh, equity committee in Garrett Motion and are currently representing the ad hoc committee of equity security holders in the LATAM Airlines case. Thank you, Lori. Paul? Thank you. I'm Paul Halpern, Chief Investment Officer at Versa Capital. Really happy to be here. Um, I think it's a great topic. I'm looking forward to the discussion. We invest in um, distress and special situations in the middle market. Historically, we've distinguished ourselves with more severe distress and lower ends of the middle market. In this environment, we're actually um, focusing more on less distressed uh, transitional and special situations and larger companies because it's such a peculiar time. Indeed, thank you, Paul. Uh, Neil? Hi, thanks for having me today. Neil Knapp with AVs Capital Management. We're uh, lower middle market investors, really focused on complex situations. And uh, that, could be, that could be stressed or distressed or restructuring oriented situations. It could also be other funky or off the run types of deals. And as Paul alluded to, I think that's the latter has been more of what we've been seeing recently, but uh, our approach is really to bring problem solving capital to complex situations. We're uh, able to invest flexibly across debt, equity, control, non-control. Uh, most of what we do tends to be structured and really our, uh, our mission is to help solve problems. And if we can do that effectively, then hopefully we can be part of a value creation story and benefit from that. 
last but certainly not least, Mark. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Mark Padgani. I'm a managing director with Getzla Henrik and Associates. Uh, based, I'm based in New York. Um, Getzla Henrik uh, is a financial and operations consulting firm that works with uh, stressed and distressed companies in the lower middle market and the middle market uh, throughout the country and also internationally. Um, we also have a, a, a division, J.H. Uh, Valens, that works with private equity portfolio companies uh, providing performance improvement services like uh, supply chain sourcing, uh, top line and margin growth, uh, data analytics, uh, and, and the like. Thanks, Mark. So with that, I hope that the audience can see that what you really have here is a very experienced and broad uh, group of panelists that have a deep experience in the distress space and special situation space, and they were handpicked to be able to discuss this from various angles. But let's just get right into what the description of today's topic is, which is when an investor is asked, about distressed opportunities in today's marketplace. And they say, which I've heard several times, what distress? Um, how accurate is that? And what are you all seeing? And you got a little glimpse from some of the introductions here, but really what are, what are each of you seeing? And maybe we'll start with you, Lori. Sure, thanks, Great. Carolyn. Um, I, I think that, you know, certainly at the outset of COVID, we expected a, um, a watershed event uh, in terms of distressed and challenged companies uh, throughout the, the pandemic, uh, which hasn't really materialized. So there, there's, there's no question that there are far fewer opportunities than we thought there were going to be um, at the outset of COVID. Um, I, I would say that from, from the investment banking perspective, the types of situations that we're seeing fall into two categories. The first is companies that were challenged pre-COVID um, and were basically allowed to limp along because of COVID. So I, I'm talking about companies where there was inadequate CapEx, there was perhaps um, uh, covenant defaults or close to covenant defaults, but banks were loath to, uh, to, uh, to start any kind of enforcement action or push the companies towards sale because, because of the pandemic. And there were really, it was really sort of a scary time for people to think about what was gonna happen. So they allowed them to limp along. I think currently, we're seeing, as we emerge from the pandemic, we're seeing banks being a little bit more aggressive. Uh, we are currently working on two situations where the lenders have said, okay, it's time to get this company geared up for sale and, and, and move along. So I think that's category one. The second category, I think, of opportunities for investors really are those companies that were laid low by the pandemic. Um, we saw it in, in the travel industry, airlines, uh, Hertz rental cars, um, and then companies who uh, had um, manufacturing facilities in areas of the world that were completely shut down by COVID. Um, in the Garrett Motion case, they, they had a factory in Wuhan, Wuhan, China, which was really one of the precipitating events to, to that filing because that was shut down um, for uh, nearly three months. So those opportunities as travel starts to rebound, as those companies uh, actually are back sort of on plan, present real opportunities for investors because I think the equity is in those situations is, is still undervalued and hurts, although I wasn't involved in that, is an excellent example of how equity really um, uh, benefited and prevailed and investors came in and got a, a really attractive deal. So I think those are, that's how I would describe what we're seeing. Thanks, Lori. Um, we'll just go around. Uh, Mark, do you want to chime in? Sure. Um, you know, the, as 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 Lori said, uh, it's it's muted today. Um, there isn't as much distress as as one would like, but there there are um, sectors where you do see distress. Um, uh, there's uh, you know healthcare. So there there's a number of industries where there's long term restructurings uh, in in place, um, uh, and will go on for years. Uh, healthcare, retail. Um, oil and gas, uh, commercial real estate, higher education. Uh, those are all industries that we, where we're seeing distress, we're working with clients um, and they're long-term restructuring plays. And uh, of course there are other, you know, there, there's the particular company that 
um, just has distress that's particular to itself, um, not necessarily an industry, but there's always an issue that, uh, you know, comes up that results in distress or stress of some sort. So we are seeing, you know, sort of the one-off company here and there that uh, is, is having issues. So that's, that's kind of where we're, we're seeing distress for the most part today. Okay, Dan. Yeah, I would echo those sentiments. You know, it, it, there's no question that you know how six trillion dollars of government stimulus combined with you know kind of the great reopening, you know, creates a situation where it's you know if you were on the edge, you're doing all right right now, and very low interest rates combined with good credit at the banks have you know prompted them to really push off any sort of um, kind of more uh, deeper enforcement on borrowers who are not um, not meeting their covenant. So the, the lenders haven't cracked down. Um, so we aren't seeing any broad-based distress, maybe outside of a couple of areas. There are some pockets within commercial real estate. Um, I'd say commercial real estate outside of industrial specifically, because industrial is still very strong. Um, you're seeing some stuff, but you know, look, through the pandemic, you did absolutely see pockets of distress. Uh, we saw a lot of activity in retail. We saw quite a bit of activity in energy. Um, and I think you'll see, you know, as Mark said, one-off pop-ups coming into play as, as things materialize. We're working with a, a parking company right now. So, you know, again, on the commercial real estate side um, and, and then individual deals um, that, uh, that pop up just because things always happen in specific companies where you can find uh, opportunistic um, paths to, to do something. Thanks, Dan. Paul, are you um, seeing uh, any distress or special situations these days? Um, I, I think that uh, Mark and Dan have done a great job of going through the um, catalog of industries that were in restructuring and didn't, things didn't get better. Um, but I have to say that I don't see those as uh, distress investing opportunities in general, um, because distress investing is actually a lagging indicator in any um, sector because you can't invest while it's um, still doing this for macro reasons. And, and so we've been staying away from a lot of those sectors um, from before the pandemic. I certainly agree. I personally think that 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 the lender community has been smarter since 2007 at saying this is a temporary phenomenon. I will protect my loan best by waiting. Uh, um, and, and they're not wrong. That's why I would love to love them to panic and sell to me because it's a temporary phenomenon and it'll come back. So we're, we're looking at a lot of situations, not so much, for example, to be concrete, we're not particularly interested in retail, although that's been a long, a long uh, specialty for us at Versa. Um, but I'm very interested in consumer products companies because the demand for stuff is going to come back or has maintained, and so and uh, distribution channels are significantly disrupted, and that disruption is going to continue. So there's a, an operational transformation opportunity in any kind of consumer products company to adapt to the new channels, and that creates um, the kind of uh, special situations that we're focused on. It's just one concrete example. No, no, I agree. And I think we're, we'll, we will come back to uh, what you were just talking about on the operational disruption. Um, one thing you said I thought was interesting about the lenders maybe being smarter. I, I, I think the same, although I wonder if possibly it's because in 2008, there were more restrictions on lenders in light of the type of uh, environment we were in there versus this environment, right? So um, we can come back around that, but it, I agree. Lenders are definitely acting different than they were in 2008, whether it's because they're smarter or because the situation is just different. I, I'll hold my comment on that. But uh, Neil, do you want to um, just let us know what you're seeing out there? Yeah, much of the same. And, and I would say that uh, one thing that we've been really focused on is that a lot of what has come to be interesting is really not what we would traditionally think of as distressed or restructuring oriented. Uh, a lot of it is just stemming from phenomena like what Paul was describing. Supply chain disruption has been pretty large across the market. We've also seen a lot of 
market dislocations with specific commodities. People have been talking a lot about steel and lumber and other things that have really uh, moved in one way or the other. Um, oil obviously took a big swing there in the energy markets. And so we've been really focused on, particularly within the consumer facing industries, things that may have um, experienced a temporary disruption because of ex external market forces. But to Paul's point, we agree there have been some uh, accelerations of longer term trends that may be interesting for us to capitalize on. And in the short run, if we can provide capital that solves a supply chain constraint or other problem, that might be sort of a win-win situation. Yeah. Thanks, I can maybe just say one thing on the lender community. I don't think lenders act until they're pushed to act, right? So that might be by the regulators. It might be by capital constraints. It might be by um, just too high levels of non-performing assets, whatever it is, you're seeing very low levels of non-performing assets at lenders and the regulators are absolutely giving free passes to them through the pandemic to say, hey, work through this. Don't get, you don't have to force this off your balance sheet. So, you know, I, I don't think you're, until something changes, until you see a dramatic uptick in non-performing assets um, or push from shareholders or whatever, I don't think you're going to see dramatic actions by the by lenders, broadly speaking. Yeah, I would Absolutely. only I would only caveat that, Dan, by saying that we we've got a situation where um, the market for for the product actually happens to be very hot. Uh, the company is not performing, and so the lenders really see this as an opportunity to push that company to a sale because it the the over you know sort of the 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 overarching um, industry is, is, is on fire right now. And they, they think that they can get value out and get out whole. So, so we can continue this discussion, but let's couch it in the question of, you all have mentioned various industries that you think there's continuing distress and potential opportunities, but for our audience, I, how are, where and how are investors finding these opportunities. We all, I think, agree they're few and far between. And Paul has mentioned that, you know, his firm has gone from, you know, very distressed to being happy to invest in a company that's just somewhat distressed or a special situation. But where and how are investors finding this? And I think what we what we have just been talking about plays, plays into this. So uh, Dan, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to. Yeah, I, I think right now, the, the way you're going to find deals is relationships. I don't even think it's a question. And so it's relationships, particularly in the distress space, with a broad range of people. I mean, I look at this panel, right? It's turnaround investment bankers. It's turnaround consulting companies. It's restructuring attorneys. It's you know distressed private equity investors. Having relationships with those folks who see deal flow in different ways or driving different opportunities, that's where we find deals. We just did um, a deal we closed a few weeks ago. We bought a, uh, a distressed auto leasing company, uh, about 7,000 cars. And it was through a relationship with a restructuring advisor. Um, they were underwater. It was a very specific situation where their, their largest customer ended up being some crazy Ponzi scheme. Uh, it was called Sutton Leasing. I think we put out a press release on it and the lenders forced the sale of the business and we got involved. Um, and, you know, one of those situations where we floated a number to them back in, I think it was February, they went down the path with some Apollo subsidiary and we kind of hung around the hoop that deal with Apollo ended up falling apart. And they called us up in mid April and said, Hey, can you get back in? Oh, and by the way, can you close in like three and a half weeks? And we dove into this thing. And you know, another kind of interesting anecdote with this, um, we were getting financing for the deal and we had gotten an initial term sheet at, you remember, we got a close on a distressed company in three and a half weeks at over 17%. We reached out to a, a large family office and a, and a bank and we ended up closing the, the financing um, with Wells Fargo at instead of 17%, uh, L plus six, um, and instead of, and probably went up about 15% in terms of the amount of capital that they gave us. Um, so there's a, there is a lot of capital out there and people are willing to finance deals. And we went from 
NDA to funding with Wells Fargo in 15 days. Um, now, is that kind of an asset-based deal where they knew the assets reasonably well? But uh, capital is, uh, there, there's a lot of money out there is I guess the point. So if you have relationships and you find one-off opportunities, I don't think that's a stressed industry per se, but it's an interesting deal. We did two other deals this year. Um, we did two energy loans, which if you would have asked me a year ago, would Hilco be doing energy loans? I would have said no way, but it was a stress base. I don't think those deals come to us now, but a few months ago when oil prices were much different, it was a different scenario. And we were able to do two sizable energy loans uh, within Hilco, which is a kind of an interesting thing. So you gotta be fast and you gotta be opportunistic. Absolutely. I think I'll just keep myself off of mute. Um, who, who else wants to follow up? I absolutely agree. Uh, sound, sounds great, Dan. I'm hearing relationships. And in these um, situations, you really need to think outside the box of your comfort zone and look at areas of opportunity outside of what Hilco normally would invest in. And they invested in that and being able to be nimble on, on this. Anyone else want to add where? Yeah, I would. Are finding deals? I would add, Carolyn, I, I agree that it's relationships. I, I think particularly, you know, being close to investment bankers, because we see them from our industry groups. So I, I see my deals, we go to market with deals that our industry groups have identified as being a challenged or difficult uh, transaction. So they, they come to us that way. But to, to really underscore Dan's point, we, we just finished uh, the, uh, the sale of Carlos Pasta. When we took that company to market, just to illustrate the, the lack of, um, uh, of opportunities in this space, we had over 80 indications of interest in the company. And ultimately, the buyer was not somebody that we identified as being in the lane. It was somebody that really was an outlier that was doing a, you know, that was really a, a company that produced um, gluten-free foods that was adding um, a, a pasta capacity. And so it wasn't something that we thought would be a, a natural fit. So I guess the point is, you know, you sometimes you have to scratch beneath the surface It had a great manufacturing facility and they found that it was, there were synergies there for them that they couldn't, they couldn't build. So it was a really a um, more of a, of a real estate slash facility play than an operating company play. But um, I think that, again, knowing your investment banker and staying close to the investment banking community um, really is, is, is a good way to, to make sure that you're, you're in, the, in the flow of, of what's coming to market. Absolutely. I, I, would, I would add, um, I mean, Lori made a good point about um, uh, industry groups. I mean, I, I get uh, Cowan's, uh, Lori's emails uh, every, every week about what's going on out there. And um, you know, if you have deep knowledge in an industry, you really get to know who the players are and where the issues are, and um, and you're you're connected. If you don't have a deep connection to to industry or industries, then you know, like your your investment bankers, your your turnaround firms, you know, who may have uh, you know specialists in an area, um, they're really close to the dynamics and can kind of hear about things early on. Um, you know, kind of the rumors and those kinds of things that you don't see. The other thing I think is, is research. Um, there's a lot of publicly available information, you know, so for example, on BDCs and, and, and mark, marketing to market, uh, although, you know, um, you, you know uh, some of that is, is dated and things can happen quickly, but um, there is some really good uh, industry information out there or just, you know, research that's available to, to kind of get in depth and find out what's going on because uh, it, it doesn't rise up to the surface um, you know, like, uh, like the, the harvest is ready to reap, you know, this is, you got to go find it. So that, that's one way to, to, to also find uh, some opportunities. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, as we said, lenders have been patient. They've allowed amendments, extensions. In some cases, they've extended more capital to provide runway. And I think part of what we've seen, and this really is consistent with the relationship point, is that over the last year, there were opportunities we thought would have been actionable 12 months ago, and they weren't at that time. And then we thought they would be actionable six months later, but somebody stepped up, it was a lender or it was an existing investor, and it still wasn't actionable. I can tell you in the last couple of months, even as recently as this week, we've had a couple of those resurface, and now they're actionable. And part of the reason we're getting the call on those is that we've kept that dialogue going. We've established some rapport with 
either the existing investors and or the management team. In one case in particular, we actually pitched an idea a year ago that now is topical. And so we got a call and said, hey, how would you think about this? And by the way, would you fund it? And so I think staying persistent with some of those relationships and trying to be value add along the way may or may not result in the deal, but occasionally it will. And that's probably worth the time. I agree. What isn't happening, as uh, Dan described, much faster than usual is happening much slower than usual. The time case in general is off because the environment is so peculiar. All right. So we're going to continue this, but what I want to try to focus on is we've heard industries. Let's just kind of recap for where we are, right? So the first thing I'm hearing is there are certain industries slash sectors that are potentially having distress based on various things. And what Paul, uh, and I think it was either Neil or Dan started to talk about before, and I know Mark is very familiar with this, is the fact of you have certain industries where you're going to have this demand surge, but you're gonna have operational issues. So let's, let's try to summarize here where we're seeing and thinking and you know how investors are finding them. Yes, relationships and uh, research, and um, you know having to be outside your comfort zone. But to recap, where where are we seeing these um, industry wise? I know you said it before. I just want to try to recap it for people. We're hearing um, because I have one question in the in the box here. Are we seeing it? Let me say it differently. During the pandemic, uh, Lori was saying that you had certain companies that were poorly performing beforehand and will help through. I had one of those companies, we were literally on the verge of filing a, a, a huge healthcare case for a bankruptcy. Within probably three weeks, COVID hits. Instead of causing the demise, all the funding helped them survive <laughs> their cash crunch. So uh, they are doing fine now. And so we had that kind of situation. But I think what I'm hearing is there are, of course, going to be industries, sectors where the demand is going to out be greater than, you know, they're going to have issues with, for instance, their supply chain. Um, what else? What else are we seeing there? Where, 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 are we, where are they going to find deals? That's just, you're really recapping a little bit of what you said before, but I want to articulate it more clearly for people that are asking some questions. I, I would have to say that where I sit, I thought I had a broadly diversified portfolio before the pandemic hit, and I did not have a company that was not impacted in a significant way by the pandemic. And so I hear about other people's portfolios of more um, delivery, um, software, those kinds of things that weren't impacted, but old economy, it was like all across the map. And what I'm seeing coming as in the, in the next wave is that the supply chain challenges are going to hit every single one of my portfolio companies, which is still a very diverse portfolio and it's going to be everywhere. And my, the management teams that don't ha haven't seen it coming yet are just, it, it, it means that it's beyond that wave and they have, it's just a matter of depth of vision because I think it's going to be everywhere and everywhere. Yeah, even the restaurant sectors have had that. You've seen it in the press that they have the demand back, but they have to limit their menu because of supply issues. It's all across food, I, I would say. In the food production space, input costs have gone up. You've got have grain costs going up. So protein producers are, are having difficulties. They had massive outages with COVID inf impacting processing plants. So food is, a, is, is an area where we think there's going to be a, a lot of opportunity uh, in the future um, and really across that spectrum to Paul's point. And food is mostly a domestic supply chain, right? right? Food doesn't come in containers for a month. Food doesn't get flown around the world. There are exceptions, obviously, but, uh, and food didn't get held up in Suez. So everything. I, I would, I would um, you know, echo what's been said, but um, one thing to keep in mind is you know, what Paul said earlier about consumer products, you know, so during the pandemic, what were people buying? You know, people were buying sweatpants and tomato sauce. And now people are shifting to, you know, eating out and they're buying things to, let's say, go out in as an analogy, you know, for food or clothing. But if you think about those kinds of shifts, 
Um, you know, people were buying goods for the, you know, for to exercise at home. Well, you know, do, does everybody want to keep exercising at home? I don't know, maybe not. And maybe the demand for those products will fall. And, um, you know, the folks that kind of ramped up capacity and, you know, all that uh, to, to satisfy that demand, well, they may have a drop in sales and, and therefore, you know, may have some issues, maybe perfectly great companies, but maybe they, you know, ramped up too quickly. And now they have to, you know, f- fill in the gap. So I, I think, you know, the question is, where's the, where's the spending going now? Um, and where was the spending? And are the, the companies that benefited from the spending during the pandemic are going to, you know, have a, um, you know, a lapse because of just of a shift in, in, in what people are doing. And I think the same thing on the industrial side. You know, you had, let's say, the airline industry, you know, the aerospace suppliers, you know, no one was buying planes, you know, production, uh, production lines, you know, were slowed down or stopped. And if you're, you know, supplying components to build uh, airplanes and the like, um, you know, things were, you know, pretty light in the pandemic and now things are ramping up. So, uh, you know, Boeing's uh, selling jets like uh, there's no tomorrow again. So uh, you got to crank it up. And uh, are you prepared to crank it up? So those are the kinds of issues I think that, that we're, we're watching very carefully. You know, 15 years ago, Mark's colleagues came to our offices to do a training about supply chain whipsaw, right? And it's a common, common process. You change demand and you limit communication across the supply chain and you get problems that just grow exponentially. And it is... It, it, it is a reality of the world we live in. And we have had, we're now in our third cycle of major changes in demand, um, both rotation and overall magnitude changes. And that's, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. I, I would, what everybody's saying is, you know, we have a business uh, where we deal with wholesale inventory. And so Hilco in general does well with disruption. It doesn't have to be distress, right? It's, it's up or down movement, but there's no question that we've seen a ton of opportunity in people who have built in inventories in the wrong areas or right seasonal stuff where they missed and doesn't have to be a distressed company. It just has to be a company that has excess inventory that they need to find an outlet for, just need to get off out of a warehouse or it's right, they're not getting credit from their lenders on their borrowing line for it, whatever it is, and they have to move that stuff. And one of the areas, you know, 2021 in our in a lot of our core businesses has been slower. That business for us has actually been quite active. And we've seen a lot of opportunity in terms of wholesale inventories that people need to figure out a solution for. And, and with that, and then we can go to Neil for a minute, but Dan, for instance, someone recently, uh, I knew a local business and it was a really local mom and pop business and they did business locally. If they get the excess inventory, they need someone like you or someone else to come in to help them get a broader consumer base. Not everything is on the internet to sell. I'm sure a lot of people are needing help moving uh, office furniture, yeah. right? So. <laughs> furniture is expensive to move <laughs> yeah yeah I had I had a, a client um, exiting a lease or possibly exiting a lease and we were in the discussions with the landlord and the client says well we'll give them value we'll leave the furniture and the landlord's like I don't want your furniture <laughs> we have so much furniture that's that's a negative not a positive let's come up right so I, I get that uh, Neil did you want to add something to this one yeah, I would just say we went through the exercise at a couple of different points in the last 15 months of trying to look a few layers deep in the supply chain. So for industries like aviation, hospitality, uh, restaurants, brick and mortar retail, all places where we've spent time, we looked a few layers deep in the supply chain to say everyone's aware that a hotel might be experiencing distress or you know a shortfall in demand or an airline may have experienced it for some time as well. But as we looked at the suppliers to those companies and the second, the, the tier two suppliers to those companies, we found a lot of opportunities. And those are some of the ones that have persisted over the last 12 to 15 months as demand in some of these pockets of industries have not quite come back yet. And so these sort of um, persistent needs to try to address the problem, but the battle of not being willing to address it yet is starting to come to a head where as demand has not yet fully rebounded, Ultimately, there's got to be a reckoning where a solution has to be implemented. So 
uh, a few of our interesting opportunities have come from that second layer of supply chain analysis. Okay, so Neil, we'll stay with you for a minute. And when we're del delving deeper, as we see an industry, and then we see a sector, and we see you know you know supply issues being an issue, how do you determine when there is real value in a business? Uh, you know, where in the capital stack maybe, you, you know, is the value to invest in, how you should invest? How, how do you start getting into the details of the opportunity? Yeah, great question. I, I mean, I think some of the initial analysis is the same as with any type of investment, right? Are there fundamental reasons for this business to exist? Does it have meaningful brands? Does it have customer loyalty? Does it have some IP or some differentiated value proposition that make it a special and unique company. I think those are things you still want to check the box on. Um, and then you have to ask yourself why, how did we get here and why? What was the cause of the issues that this company is facing today? Were they external market-wide temporary disruptions or dislocations that may be aberrations in the longer run or were they more self-inflicted and company specific? And then you've got to look at that and try to peel back the onion on is that something that can be solved? Um, you know, I think part of how we look at if these situations are investable is to determine uh, what is the need, number one, is it a liquidity need? Is it a change of control? Is it something else? And number two, can we solve that need in a manner that uh, provides us with enough margin of safety or, or cushion to, uh, what the real intrinsic value of the company is. And, and the reason we look for that is because with distress, with special situations, more often than not, unexpected things arise. And you can't plan for all of those because these, so these situations, to Dan's example, are sometimes moving very quickly. There are a lot of moving pieces with different, um, maybe creditors, investors, et cetera. And so part of how we look at these is, can we solve the problem at a point in the capital structure where there's enough margin of safety from an enterprise value junior to us that we can withstand a shock in case we got it wrong in some way or in case we missed something. Uh, some, fo some folks focus more on the assets. Do we have collateral coverage? Can we, you know, Dance Firm, for example, knows a lot about assets. They look at those and say, are we comfortable with what we have here as a fallback plan? Um, and so for us, it's really about selecting the part of the capital structure where we can solve the problem, number one, otherwise they don't need us. And number two, can we do it in a way where through either uh, you know, interest on debt or a, or a pick dividend or something associated with an equity investment, can we generate some current return? And then do we think there are longer term reasons to rebound to a place where there's real equity value? And, and if there is, then how do we help create that outcome and how do we participate in that outcome? So. Those things, long way of saying, are, are really why we focus on sort of the middle of the capital structure a lot of the time. Um, and that's really where we find the most comfort in the risk return trade-off. Um, I, I was about to say a word that might not be good for uh, public radio here, but uh, it's like, damn, you know, adding value there, you know, <laughs> appreciate those uh, golden nuggets, Neil. Um, that's exactly why we do these kind of events to really give valuable information and insights. How, how, how do the distressed private equity players think? What are they looking for? How are they protecting themselves? Because people are finding these deals and investing successfully. So thank you, appreciate um, that, that transparency, Neil. Anyone else want to add to this, what you're thinking? Um, go ahead, Paul. I would um, just say that, that, that all of us, think of distress as different because we're not in the business of moving money from point A to point B. We're in the business of solving problems. And, and that's, I think, a common perspective, certainly from this panel, I suspect from everybody who's um, in attendance today. And, and what that means is that when we're looking at valuation, we are applying both an understanding of the real volatility from the risks and changes that are coming, but also we are extrapolating. We're not looking at the, the historical value, we're looking at the present situation and the response to those changes, and that differentiates. Um, so we were just in a deal that we did not buy, 
um, that was all about trying to decide how, how to value a COVID spike. And that was because this was a business in the food business had a huge, huge improvement um, uh, from, from both price and volume through the pandemic and uh, had gone from, you know, sponsors writing checks to solve working capital problems to um, a more than call it a doubling of EBITDA and, and took it to market and how do you value that? And I think that that, that trying to value across change and volatility is, is the, the solution um, in, is, is how you solve the problem in these circumstances. Excellent. And, and I, I think that's, that's what makes, what Paul just said is what makes it so difficult right now is the projection going forward. And when you talk about where you're gonna play in the capital structure, I think a lot of investors, they, they have certain comfort. So for example, Paul's firm, you know, they've, they've purchased uh, debt before, they make equity investments and they have some flexibility um, depending on the situation, Neil as well, and, uh, and, 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 and Dan too. And, and so I think you have to be flexible today. And if you're only comfortable in equity, you know, it, it may be difficult because equity may not be, you know, uh, so common, but, do, you know, doing the projections to determine what the value is, is so tricky because if you did have a COVID bump, for example, or, or you're, you're a hotel and, uh, you know, the, the future looks bright now, you know, you know, what, when's business travel going to come back and I have a labor shortage. So is that going to restrict my revenue in the short term? Um, uh, you know, where I had these lofty goals in mind, but now I, I can't clean the rooms. So doing the projections to determine what the value is, is, is very tricky. Um, and, and, you know, to Neil's point about, you know, having that margin of error, you really need that margin of error today. Yeah, I, I think one of the keys, like in just in general in distressed investing, and I know that Neil and Paul can appreciate this, right? it's figuring out where that fulcrum security is. And it's a word that gets tossed around a lot and you can use it to describe a bunch of things, but right, how are you going to get involved in this investment? And where, what's the value? Is there equity value? Do I take control of the company through the equity if I'm going to invest? Is the equity washed out? And do I have to come in through the debt? Well, is the senior debt the one that's going to control this process, or there is there a tranche of junior debt that's actually more important to this to take control of it? And so figuring out what that value is, and, and to Mark's point and, and Paul's point, figuring out that right now is very difficult because the world is in flux and, and it's very hard to understand what things are going to look like in six months in different industries. Some things you might be able to, you know, for Hilco, right? We underwrite to the assets. So we're not trying to put an EBITDA multiple on something. We're trying to figure out what the assets are. And we have a pretty good sense of that, generally speaking. But if you can figure out where that fulcrum security is and how to play that, and can you buy it in the secondary market? Can you do a direct loan? Can you come in through different ways? That, that from a distressed investing standpoint, is really a critical piece of the puzzle. And, and that goes back to relationships and research as far as figuring that out and having conversations with others that are involved already, having relationships with pre-existing lenders, perhaps others interested, what are they hearing? What are you reading as far as figuring out where the fulcrum security really is? I mean. Yeah. Our um, cross asset desk trades in, in you know, claims and securities and, and bank debt and whatnot. And sometimes we can get a very good sort of gut check feel on where value breaks because you can, if the bank debt is trading in the high 90s and the general unsecured trade claims are chasing par, then you know that, you're, that, that you're, the value is probably uh, in, in the unsecureds or in the equity. But if the bank debt's trading you know, substantially down, that's probably a good indication that, um, that there, you know, it may not, it's not 100% accurate, but it does tell you that you know, the market believes that the, the bank debt is impaired. So it gives you a good idea. Um, so knowing where the, where the existing um, constituents in the cap stack are willing to part with their paper is, is always a, a, a good place to start. And I think that, that that's, that's, I think one of the beauties of where we are today is it, it seems trickier than normal to figure out what 
you know, what projections look like and what value is. And, but that's where the arbitrage opportunities, you know, the mispricing of, um, you know, of parts of the capital structure. And, you know, as, uh, you know, investors, you know, lo lo love that, right? You know, it's all about, uh, you know, I, I did the analysis and I, you know, I realized that this is, you know, undervalued and, you know, because everybody's doing the projections this way and I did them this way kind of thing. Um, and it's a really good opportunity uh, to, to find value that no one sees. And, and I think that's what, go ahead, Paul. Um, um, I'm not seeing that very much. I think one of the consequences of it being a temporary circumstance is that people can talk themselves into a very positive view. Um, and certainly the private lending pools have every incentive to maintain a positive view for as long as they can. And so uh, in general, what I'm seeing in this marketplace is people who have um, uh, confidence in their assets, maybe even too much confidence in their assets until something forces their hand. And as long as there's all of this liquidity sloshing around, um, hands are not being forced. And so, so I am, I'm not seeing those um, opportunities from differences in opinion yet, because all the differences of opinion uh, that I'm seeing are existing leaders are optimistic and new investors are um, much more anxious about the future. And I think that that's, that's, that's the normal state of affairs until you get to um, something that forces, forces people to make moves. So when the government funding starts to uh, wind down a bit and lenders are willing to start taking action is when, when and where we'll, we'll start seeing some real play. So, so one of the things that the cycle that I see is that the supply chain problem is going to create a lot of these temporary price increases that's going to start reading as sustainable inflation uh, in the Fed's metrics and that will produce an increase in interest rates. And then you get something that's a positive cycle, that's a reinforcing cycle that has a, a depressive impact on expectations and the economy. And that's where I would, that's, that's the combination that's gonna create the turn, not this year, um, not next year, but, uh, but in, I would say 23, 24. And that's why you're chief investment officer at Versa. There you go. Um, I, I want to cover a couple more things. Um, one of the questions we had was uh, in a sector focus, which was, I think it was, uh, it, it's off the chat now, but it was um, credit card swiping. Um, does anyone, you know, they were hearing that maybe that was an industry that's starting to go up and is undervalued. Does anyone have any insights in credit card swiping business? Okay, so not, not something that anyone here is hearing as a hot distressed industry. Let's fintech, turn to some- Fintech in general is, is what's still in growth land, I think. Right, and, and so that may be good opportunities there if people want to invest in that, even though it's not necessarily distressed, it just may be a growing market, I think, right? Um, let's, let's turn to real estate because that's a hot topic and various uh, things have happened recently. Um, anyone can take this. Want to start us off, Mark? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, real estate's a very uh, diverse market. You know, um, there, there are different uh, segments, you know, there's industrial and multifamily, uh, hotel, retail, et cetera, and, and, uh, um, and others. But, but I would say, you know, and, and people are very familiar with this, but the two key areas right now are hotels and retail. Um, and uh, with office, you know, potentially coming, um, you know, with hotels, as everybody knows, uh, they were closed for a period during the pandemic. Um, and even at the end of Q1 this year, there were still a number of uh, luxury hotels that were closed. So, um, you know, business travel has been slow to come back um, so far, which is stretching out the recovery. And, you know, the longer it takes for a hotel to kind of get back to where it was um, with its capital structure, you know, the more opportunity is for an issue to arise, like I've used uh, our interest reserves and I don't have any more money left. Uh, or, you know, the sponsor or owner uh, put in all the money they had and they've run out of money or the, 
you know, the borrower and, and the lender uh, are both fatigued and they want uh, a change. So there's a lot of opportunity for that. And I think it takes a long time. And I think you're just starting to see things happen now, uh, like bubble up to the surface that maybe were lying beneath the surface. You know, with retail, um, there are cl clearly issues prior to the pandemic. Um, and with more stores closing during the pandemic, uh, landlords providing rent deferral and uh, abatement um, concessions, you know, that weakened the financial position of a number of landlords. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty around, you know, rents going forward um, and, you know, what, you know, what kind of incentives you need to provide to, um, you know, to, to, to new tenants to, you know, to, to lease space. And I think that's one of the things that's also going on in, in office. Um, you know, there were a lot of companies, you know, in fact, I had a client that was trying to get out of five floors in a New York City building um, and uh, was able to do it, uh, paying some cash up front and some cash down the road and, uh, um, you know, another incentive even further down the road. Um, but, you know, there were similar rent deferral and abatement deals uh, with, uh, with those landlords. And now with the reopening, there's a lot of chatter about reducing footprint. So there's a lot of sublease space in the market, which is reducing rents. Um, and landlords uh, are, are having to provide increasing dollar amounts for these tenant allowances to attract it. So there, there's a lot of things going on in the real estate market. It, it has been taking a while to bubble to the surface, um, but, but it is going on. It's going to take a long time to play out, but you're starting to see it. We may be in the, this is my opinion, but we may be in the, you know, the first or second inning on uh, commercial real estate. And do you want to add to that? Yeah, you know, we have a, a lease restructuring business. So we help uh, tenants, primarily retailers and restaurants, um, renegotiate leases. And there is no question that there is a multi, probably decade trend. There was just way too much retail space in the U.S. Retail um, square footage per capita in this country is like, more than five times the second highest country. So there is far too much retail space. It will take years and years to play out. Uh, there are absolutely very smart people who think that 20 to 30% of the malls in this country will close. You know, the good malls will still be fine and the B and C malls will continue to get hit. This probably accelerated it. You saw four, I believe, three or four mall bankruptcies within the last year, whereas we had not seen a mall bankruptcy for a long time in this country. Um, and I, I don't think that's going to stop. You, you have a little bit of an interesting time where you have uh, traffic going up dramatically at this moment as, as everything reopens, but you're, the, the broader trends of that are gonna continue and mall vacancies um, actually grew by the fastest amount they've ever grown from the fourth quarter to the first quarter uh, regional mall vacancies to from 10 and a half percent to 11.4 percent. So it's not it's not something that's slowing down. Um, it, it, I would tell you B and C malls, if you were an investor in those, I would be very worried and somebody's going to have to figure out ways to redevelop them. And there are things that are being done, but um, it will be one-off situations. Some of them will become Amazon fulfillment centers. Some of them will become, you know, medical office buildings. Some of them will become, you know, multifamily. But uh, th there's just too much retail space in this country, without question. And, and we actually have a we have a, a media client who does live entertainment, and we're in the process of doing <clears throat> a joint venture agreement with uh, that client and a, a and a mall owner. Um, to start bringing some live entertainment, um, some fun stuff to uh, the malls. <laughs> so that that um, different purposes for the mall space. And you mentioned uh, the bankruptcy filings. You had Washington Prime Mall file, I think on Monday um, with 102 locations. When I looked at their papers, it sounded like they were in, they were having problems before COVID because more tenants wanted to go to freestanding space to get uh, better visibility, traffic, reduce the camp costs and things of that nature. And, and COVID just exasperated it uh, according to them. So I thought that was an interesting take. I wasn't aware um, about that exit from tenants generally from the malls pre-COVID and certainly COVID has caused malls to uh, have problems. I know we're going over just a couple of minutes here. Um, so we'll wrap this up. What we'll do now is just go around um, any 
you know, concluding thoughts about um, capitalizing on distress. If you could include for those uh, investors on this um, panel, there is a question, let me just pull it back up, really just wanting to know whether the targeted returns um, of yesteryear, if you're able to make them nowadays, uh, you know, the risk reward expectations seem to be different, they're, they're stating, and just curious if your LPs are getting the returns that they were expecting in yesteryear or have um, expectations changed in the current environment. But with that, we'll just do a popcorn style, go around with uh, concluding thoughts, please. I mean, for us, we're, you know, look, we don't have a fund. We're, we're effectively a family office. We're investing uh, primarily our founders' capital. So we're, we're pretty disciplined about where we go. We have not changed our return expectations. Um, and and it's, it's always, you know, driven by uh, very specific opportunities. So, you know, we've been fortunate that last year was a record year from us and we've had a good start to this year with, with a different investment complexion in 2021 than it was in 2020, but uh, we have not changed our return thresholds. Yeah, I would say that uh, there's no secret that there is more capital chasing fewer deals of this type right now. And in general, that across the market will mean that there likely will be some return compression. And I think that trend has been happening for some time. That trend was accelerated by the current environment. I think what we try to focus on and where we really spend time is trying to be creative and find tricky situations that might not fit the box for more traditional investors. And if we can find those situations, which is really what keeps us busy, then we're still able to hit our target returns. And to date, we've been able to do that. And so I think our, our focus is really on creative sourcing. And then once we have something in the funnel, back to my earlier comments, it's really about a differentiated solution where, yes, our capital is expensive, but we're bringing something to the table to make that capital worth it. And so, uh, so far for us, that's been working. I, I would just add, I, I think the, the, the key here is, is to pick the right spot. And what I, what I mean by that, it's, it's pick the right industry, pick the right part of the capital structure, and, and, and do the work around it to find it. There are opportunities out there, no question, they're fewer and farther between. But if you, if you do the work, I don't think that you need to adjust your return expectations. I think you can get them if you make sure you're in the right, right spot in the capital stack. We're focused on deals where we can add more lower cost capital um, ahead of us or beside us to solve this problem because I just, there are non-distress investors whose return requirements have declined where we were, our return requirements were exactly on par with the return requirements of ordinary middle market buyout shops when I um, started this business. And they have fallen significantly in their return requirements. And now they're coming around and chasing, um, chasing stuff that is of interest to us. So, so that the answer to that is to partner with um, uh, lower cost capital so that we can keep our investors engaged. And I, I would just say that, uh, you know, there's, there's no easy way to, to finding deals that, uh, you know, achieve the returns you're looking for. Um, you know, as Lori said, you know, you're picking the right spots, um, but it requires a lot of effort. Um, you know, in past cycles, it was really easy. You know, the, the, the crop had already, you know, appeared and had been watered and you could just reap the harvest. Now you got to plant seeds, you got to water it, you got to fertilize it. It takes time and um, you got to work at it a lot, but, but the, there's stuff there um, if, if you put in the effort. So thank you. Um, I see Lena is on. I just wanted to thank the panelists and for the audience, if you're in the distressed investing space, these are the people you need to know, um, develop relationships with, reach out to them, follow them, <laughs> contact them on LinkedIn. Uh, we're always happy to try and talk with um, to try and talk with people and send you in the right direction. And uh, we hope to be a valuable resource to you. So, with Opus, thank you so much, Lena. Thank you, Opus Connect, for um, helping us put this together. And we look forward to the uh, Deal Connect portion later today. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Thank you for for putting together this all star panel. And to all of you panelists, thank you for your contributions. I hope that the audience found value. 
uh, in today's discussion. We wanna thank you all for joining us as well. And of course, to our sponsors, thank you for your support. We do have a bunch of events coming up. Uh, two notably in June, we'll have a middle market webinar next week. Uh, and then a fireside chat with Lori Torres, who uh, recently sold her company for a hundred million. We'll review her entrepreneurial journey. So stay tuned for more info on that. If you are participating in today's one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings, you're gonna wanna log out of this link and log into the separate link that was circulated yesterday. If you have questions, of course, reach out to the team. But again, thank you all uh, for participating on this panel. We hope everyone stays safe and healthy and hopefully we'll see you in person soon. Thanks everyone. Good, Thank you, Mina. Thank you everyone.